Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Uh, I am Ian Whitaker. I'm the Assistant Director for Leadership Programs at the Chicago Council. Uh, we're excited to welcome General Michael Hayden back to the Council this evening to discuss American intelligence in the age of terror. Uh, copies of General Hayden's book, Playing to the Edge, will be available for sale and signing from our partners at the bookseller uh, through, through the back of the hallway there after the program. Uh, before we begin, some quick housekeeping points. We're on the record this evening. We, uh, we welcome social media, but please silence your phones before we begin. Uh, we're also live streaming, so, so uh, welcome to everyone watching at home. Um, upcoming programs at the Council include uh, Tuesday, March 8th, we have the Council on Foreign Relations, Adam Siegel, in, conf in conversation with UI Labs, Carolyn Nowinski Collins. They'll be discussing how cyberspace is reshaping international relations. On Wednesday, March 23rd, the, the Washington Post's David Ignatius will be discussing the, the lessons for US policymaking from the Syrian civil war. On Thursday, March 31st, Yale economist Jeffrey Garten and the Financial Times' Edward Luce will discuss the past and the future of globalization. And on April 19th, we'll have an expert panel discussion in partnership with the Field Museum on efforts to tackle poaching and the global ivory trade. The Council is a public education institution generously funded by its members and donors, and we, we aim to make conversations like this evening's open to as wide an audience as possible. We're especially excited to see so many students here tonight, and we also have several veterans groups. We welcome them. We have the USO of Illinois, the Bunker 1871, uh, the William Blair Veterans, and the Loyola University Army o ROTC. Uh, turning back to this evening's program, General Hayden will be in conversation with the Council's President Evo Dalder. Uh, Evo will then moderate an audience Q&A. We'll, we'll finish at 7.15 and then have the book signing. Uh, but first, to introduce tonight's topic and speaker, please join me in welcoming the Chairman and CEO of Motorola Solutions and Chicago Council Board Member, Mr. Gregory Bryan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome this evening's distinguished speaker, General Mike Hayden, to the Council on Global Affairs. General Hayden has been at the heart of the U.S. intelligence establishment for over two decades. During this time, the security challenges facing the U.S. have changed significantly. From a Cold War focus on superpower rivalry and nuclear deterrence, to a chaotic world of failed states, global terror networks, and cyber warfare. Our enemies have evolved and improvised, always seeking to exploit new vulnerabilities, and so our intelligence agencies have retooled and reorganized. Intelligent work today compromises traditional spycraft against hostile nations, alongside counterterrorism operations, cyber espionage and defense, and many other activities. And it involves a wide complex of government agencies, some familiar, others less so, along with their international counterpart. But this work has indeed become increasingly controversial. Recent years, especially since Edward Snowden's leaks, have witnessed growing public discord regarding the size and scope and powers that our intelligence agencies have attained, particularly since 9-11. How are intelligence agencies preparing for the threat posed by ISIS and cyber warfare and other emerging challenges? Has increased scrutiny of their work impacted their effectiveness? And in today's complex world, can we achieve security while also preserving civil liberties? We're grateful to have General Mike Hayden with us to explore these questions with Ambassador Evo Dalder. Uh, by way of a very brief introduction, Hayden is a retired Air Force four-star general the former director of the NSA and the former director of the CIA, by the way, the only person ever to have hold, held both positions, a distinguished, a distinguished visiting fellow at George Mason University School of Public Policy. And Ambassador Evo Dalder is, of course, the president of the Council on Global Affairs and the former U.S. ambassador to NATO. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming both General Hayden and Ambassador Dalder. <clears throat> Greg, thank you so much for that uh, uh, wonderful introduction, and, and General Hayden, thank you so much thank, for, thank for joining us here in, in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, we'll have a bit of a conversation, then we'll open it up to, uh, uh, to the audience. Uh, start thinking about your questions you probably already have, 
uh, we'll try to control the, how, given the, the crowd, we'll try to control and make it, make it work and get to as many questions as you can. But let me start off. Let's, sure. let's start off on the big picture, the state of the world. Yeah. As you look around and see what is happening in this world, what, what is the list of things and how would you prioritize those things that are keeping you up at night? So um, let me take two runs at it, yeah. kind of two different lenses. One, the really big lens, what my army buddies would call the big hand, little map briefing, okay, where you get to go like that, all right? Um, three sentences. As bad as it seems, most people in this room have lived in a world more dangerous than today, all right? I, I go back to my own history, Cuban Missile Crisis, Soviet American Armor, Checkpoint Charlie. You can't even find Checkpoint Charlie now in, in Berlin. I was a captain in the Air Force. We went to DEFCON 3. I mean, DEFCON 5 is normal. DEFCON 1, you're chucking the funny weapons back and forth. We went to 3 when we thought the Soviets were pushing funny weapons through the Bosporus and the Dardanelles. I've seen it more dangerous. I have never seen it more complicated. Right? So you take that fur ball in the Middle East, okay, and bear with me for the cartoon here. You, you, know, you, got, you got spikes coming out of the fur ball. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Bashar al-Assad, the, the Turks, the Kurds, and, and I imagine someone saying, hey, I'm really getting worried about that spike there, Hayden, that ISIS spike, it's really bad. Do something about it. Well, if you push that ISIS spike down, guess what happens to all the other ones? They come up. So I've seen it more dangerous, never more complicated, and never more immediate. And here, I don't just mean you and I are going to see somebody's unhappy cell phone video tonight, no matter which 7x24 network we watch. I, I, I don't just mean that, although that's important. I mean when something goes bump over here, something goes bang over here almost immediately and with, with some substance. So more dangerous, never more complicated, never more immediate. No, talking about threats, all right? If I, if I do an X and Y axis up here for you in the ether, and this is severity of threat, and this is kind of like timeline. Mm -hmm. Down here in the lower, lower left-hand corner, which is the urgent corner, right? That's the one that's most immediate. Uh, terrorism and cyber stuff, all right? I mean, something could go bang tonight because uh, an unfortunate TSA agent makes a bad decision. So that's, that's immediate. You, you roll the line out here to three, five, seven years. I got a problem I think is actually more serious than the stuff in the corner. I, I call this the group of states that are ambitious, brittle, and nuclear. And here I'm lumping in the North Koreans, the Pakistanis. I throw the Iranians in there as well be, because of potentiality. And, and even in a dark moment, I throw the Russians in there too. Okay, so more time. It's not gonna happen overnight, but it's actually a more serious problem. Then I get out here to 10, 10 to 15. And this, this is the pass fail. In terms of up, going up the importance axis, this is the one way up here. Except we've got 5, 10, 15 years to deal with it, and that's China. And that's not saying China's an enemy. It's not saying China's a threat. But if we get that relationship wrong, everything heads south. So anyway, that's the quick formulation. So just, just to, to look at that, uh, you see, a, a, it's not a straight line, but it's a line from more urgent, less severe, to or more, so, but it, it's going up. Exactly right. right. Now, here, now, let me, on, on the X, Y, X. Yeah, well, let me tie it in uh, yeah, something absolutely. I'm trying to put on the book. I freely admit that your national security establishment, and particularly your intelligence services, are fixated in the lower left hand corner of that graph. All right? Um, I, I tell in the book, Mr. Ambassador, a story where Dave Petraeus and Holloway came over to the house, and Janine, who my wife's with me here, we, we had coffee and coffee cake in the kitchen. Dave was talking to all the living former directors of the CIA about a week or two before his confirmation hearings. So we did all the chit chat, swapping back and forth. And then as we're walking out and the ladies are going towards the front door in our house, I did that classic kind of Washington pull aside thing. You know, oh yeah, David, one more thing. David, CIA has never looked more like OSS than it does right now. Mm. If you think back to the history of OSS, and I said, David, that's a good thing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not complaining. I actually kind of did that. Okay, I contributed to that. But you've got to remember, it's not OSS. It's the nation's global espionage service. 
And you're going to have to fight every day like I did, like I think Leon had to do, to not just remind yourself, but to remind the institution you've got these broader, deeper, wider, more global responsibilities. And so, and so the urgent keeps pulling us down into the lower left-hand corner. And we've got these other things out there as well. So let, let me, let's stay for that for a minute. I, I want to get to many of the other issues that you write about in your book, but, but this, is, this is important. Um, because clearly, you now have the Secretary of Defense has gone out and says the number one threat to look at is Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and then the last one is terrorism and ISIS. Yep. But we don't have a national security establishment that is focused on Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and ISIS. It's all bunched up yeah. below. You're now on the outside. Uh, how will we change this? How well, do we get the focus right? I mean, Russia was a big surprise for the intelligence community in, in, yeah. in, in two years ago. It's, it, it remains a surprise every day. Yeah. It shouldn't be. Yeah, I mean, j j just even down here in the lower left-hand corner, I was out at Aspen, I guess it was a summer, it was last summer, and um, one of the panels in front of me was getting beat up a little bit about uh, not predicting ISIS, all right? And, and you know, that's kind of a jump ball. Did, did Intel have the slows or did policy have the slows in coming to grips with ISIS? Probably a mixed bag. But I, but I offered the view that the intel, perhaps, and, and I don't know, I'm not in government, but perhaps the intel guys were so focused with chopping down these trees over here, like that Al-Qaeda, that they actually didn't notice the second growth forest popping up over here. So, so number one, number one, how do, you, how do you go fix it, is that the people who are the storytellers in the room, all right, when you, when you have a policy meeting, the, as you know, the intel guys get to talk first. Yep. They are the storytellers. They, they are the ones who kind of set the left and the right-hand boundaries of intelligent conversation. And so the first requirement is for your intelligence services to actually look beyond the, the close-in ridge line and, and begin to impose on policymakers the, these, these deeper, deeper concerns and, and, and almost force them you know, to begin to spend more of their time and energy worried about those as opposed to just, just the things that are up close. Let's go to the intelligence community, sort of the way, the way you lived it, uh, and, 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 and really the topic of the book. You've been in the intelligence community for a long time. Uh, you were there in 9-11. You've yeah. been there uh, ever since. So how would you characterize the way the community? You said it's more like the OSS. How do we get there? What happened on, and, and I'm, here I'm talking really the intelligence community writ large, not just CIA. But, sure. but also all, all of the agencies. How, how would you quickly tell us, or briefly, tell us the story of the evolution? 9-11 happened, it was a huge sy right. system shock uh, to every part of the system. How did the intelligence community adapt sure. to that, to that so, change? So, so number one, we got better in a lot of things. Now, now we, we, you know, it's, it's, it's like a baseball team, all right? You're, you're never as good as you look when you're winning, and you really aren't as bad as you look when you're losing. All right, and so after 9-11, we, we, we did a lot of self-introspection. We weren't that awful prior to 9-11, despite the failure, but there are a whole bunch of things we could do better. I, I take one I, I talk about in the book is, is sharing, all right? We got beat up after 9-11. You didn't share, you don't share. Well, actually, let me tell you a sentence I never heard. You guys don't share, you're all messed up. You ought to be more like the, there's no country name that ends that sentence. All right. We, we, and now, by the way, you should not be marking on the curve when it, when it comes to grading your intelligence services. All right. <laughs> that is still not a passing grade, even though no one else could solve the equation either. All right. And so we needed, so we got better. All right. Um, something else we got a lot of money. I had $2 when, when I was director of NSA, sorry, when I was director of CIA. I had $2 for every dollar George Tenet had on September 10th, all right? So we changed some cultural things. We got a lot more resources. And, and so, again, I, I say in the book, we're not bad at this, all right? But, Mr. Ambassador, we are a nation that has been at war for 15 years. 
and the natural gravitational pull for your intelligence services is to make sure American teenagers in harm's way are protected. And so you just, you, you just I mean, it, it, gra gravity is the right metaphor. It, mm -hmm. it just pulls you down to that very specific stuff. I, one of the successes I mentioned in the book is how the National Security Agency, the N, National Security Agency, embedded itself down to the brigade level in the Army and the regiment level in the Marine Corps. Why? Because that was magic in terms of enabling American combat power. But I remind you, it's the National Security Agency. All right? It's not the Defense Security Agency. It's not the Army's or the Marine Corps security. In other words, okay, the gravitational pull of the, of the tactical need pulled an agency whose charter is to do the big stuff down here. And, and we were really good at it. And, and there are Americans who are alive today because of it. And that's, you know, that, that's an arguably a virtue, but there's a second and third order effect. Well, so that, uh, it's interesting. I, I remember in Afghanistan, this was what everyone was talking about. Right. The, the ability to know and, and, and National that tactical integration. Was, yeah. was remarkable. But it does mean, just as you're saying, it does mean that, in fact, more and more of your intelligence capacity serves the military Here, function. Yeah. Hey, so, Mr. Ambassador, here's the line I give. Much of what passes for analysis in today's intelligence, by, by the way, this sounds critical. I don't mean to be. This is descriptive. I, this is saying what I did, right? Much of what passes for analysis in today's American intelligence community is actually targeting. Mm -hmm. It's targeting for action, it's targeting for collection, or it's targeting to make sure somebody doesn't get on an airplane. But it's all about disambiguation of data and identifying and, and, and frankly, I think it is at the expense of, so what's the big picture here? Right. The, the analysis is, is being lost, the analytical piece. In that oh, look, if, we, if we had John Brennan here or some, some yeah. they, they would say, no, 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 we're, but I, I actually think, that, again, it's gravity. It just pulls you down to the, to the immediate. The, the director of CIA job is the most present tense job I've ever held. But you think that's different from what it was before 9-11? Um, it got more so yeah. post 9 11. A couple of things you didn't mention that, that, that have had, you know, been in the headlines that have changed since 9 11. Some of the more con controversial practices. Let's talk about two uh, enhanced interrogation yeah. techniques and, and uh, the phone record, the privacy, the privacy issue. Starting with the enhanced ter interrogation, um, you've said and you write uh, that you think uh, important information was. Right. was, was was taken, explain, explain sure. the argument yeah. uh, and, and, uh, and why you think these techniques in particular are the ones that are important. Yeah. So I met no one who was involved in the program who won't say what I'm telling you now, and, and that is simply that, that valuable, life-saving information not otherwise available was acquired because of this program. And I can say that because for the most part, I didn't do this. All right? I, I came to the agency in 06. Okay, and I spent the summer of 06 kind of getting a graduate degree on detentions and interrogation. I mean it. I mean, I mean this, was a, this was bigger than a 600-pound elephant in a room. I mean, this was the life of the agency. I mean, it, the, the things, the accusations and so on. Um, and so I, I had to recommend to the president, I put my own timeline on it, on it that by, by, by Labor Day, we got to have a plan. All right, we, we, we had to have a, a, an agreed way forward. So I spent the summer doing my best to master it. I could have walked away from it entirely. I could have simply said, that was then, this is now, we're done. And in conscience, I, I made the decision that I could not. Now, I changed it, okay? Um, the circumstances I had in 06 were not the circumstances George Tennant had in 2002. We knew a bunch more about Al-Qaeda. We had penetrations of Al-Qaeda. We, we, we had a better sense of the threat. And frankly, the law had changed a little bit, too. Right? So I was quite willing to skinny the program back, but not to close it. We emptied the black sites, but not closed them. We, we got rid of about half of our interrogation techniques, but not all of them. We reserved the right to keep people, but we weren't going to keep them forever. I told Steve Hadley in my first meeting, when I kind of thought my way through, Steve, we are not the nation's jailers. We are the nation's intelligence service. We, we shouldn't be keeping people forever. And, and the up 
shot of that was in Labor Day weekend in 06, we moved our last 14 prisoners to, to Guantanamo. So now, we, we knew that was very controversial. I, I take it as an honorable position, a position that actually is rooted in the, in the values that I share. If, if, if a lot of folks in this room say, yeah, I, I may or may not believe you, Hayden, that it worked, but I don't want you to do it in the first place. And that's okay. That, 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 that's an okay position. I just don't want you doing it. But we believed as a matter of historical record that we got information we would not have otherwise have gotten. And I saw, I've seen the information, all right? Uh, and so actually in the transition, I, I came here to this city to brief the president-elect in December of 2008. It was actually an interesting day. I flew into the city late at night. It's supposed to be low key, you know, you don't want the, the trip saying the director of CIA is here briefing the new president on all covert action, but that was what we were doing. And so we, we come in very late, land at IOD, come into the black suburban, get into the hotel, my security guy comes up to me and says, sir, we got a problem. I said, Rich, we've been trying to talk to the president-elect for six weeks. What do you mean we have a problem? He says, we can't have the meeting at the federal building. Why can't we have the meeting at the federal building? And he, he kind of leans forward and put his, puts his mouth next to my ear and says, because the FBI is arresting the governor in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't know that? <laughs> we don't look in, we I look guess. out. I digress. Um, <laughs> we were trying to convince President-elect Obama that he may want to put this program on the shelf, but he may not want to end it for the same reason we did not want to end it in 2006, which, which simply was, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Right. So, so that, that's kind of my take, and I, I realize there's a lot more complexities behind that, and we, we, we may get questions we, on we, it. So let me push you just on one on sure. question. When you, when you did your graduate degree on this uh, in, in the summer of 06, um, was one part of the, I think the, the most controversial part of it is there was a whole gr group of people, mainly from the FBI, arguing we can actually get more with our own traditional techniques. And did you weigh, were you able to weigh those? In, in, I, yeah, in I did. In, 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 in honesty, I did. I talked to our interrogators. All right? and, and, and in fact, when I testified to Congress, I, I would have an interrogator with me. So well, I don't know, Senator, I wasn't there, but, and then you let the, I mean, because you, you do want Congress to be fully and currently informed. That was actually one of, the, one of the things we pushed in the summer of 06, which was to tell all the members of the committees all the stuff about the detentions and interrogations. Um, there are, a, look, you're, you're, you're pointing to the testimony of Ali Soufan. Yep, who among is, others. Who, who, is, yep. who was the core FBI guy in the interrogation of Abu Zubaydah. My guys remember a completely different history than Ali Soufan remembers. And I'm, I'm saying that without judgment, all right? They, and in fact, one of the most contentious things in the Senate Democrat report on CIA interrogations was what did Abu Zubaydah say and when did he say it, mm -hmm. all right? And that remains, that remains a controversial historical record. My guys said he talked, he stopped, we applied the techniques, he talked a lot more. And Ali Soufan's story is I had him in the palm of my hand, if you had just let me go on and so, so. There are varying interpretations of history. I had to make a decision. Another decision, what you work with is, is the phone records. Yeah, and, and this and, one is and, mine. And, and, I'm, and, and I'm, so I'm, I'm inheriting this one. Th that, that one this one is mine. So, so we talked about the inheritance. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, talk about, and, and, and talk about the, con one, the context of the decision, yeah. but then also, two the consideration, how far do we want to sure. do, move on that, the privacy Thank you, that, that, that's a great way to set it up, Mr. Ambassador. So, on the afternoon of 9-11, I changed some NSA rules. Right. Totally within my authority, you know, there, there's, a, there's kind of a rheostat there. You all, me, you, are all protected against unreasonable search and seizure. We're not protected against search and seizure, we're protected against unreasonable search and seizure. One of the expressions of that I'm going to be efficient, but it's important to give the no, fine I, print. 
One of the expressions of that is something called minimization. So, look, in a global enterprise like NSA, you run across communications that are legitimately targeted, communications that are to, from, or about an American. Right? I mean, you can be targeting someone in, in the Far East, and they may actually be talking to a protected person. You. That doesn't mean you have to hang up. Right? Actually, sometimes that's the most important. I mean, if you're, if you're covering a terrorist in Yemen, and he's making a phone call to Rome, and you cover it, good. It's, you know, brother, the attack is at noon. And then he hangs up and makes a phone call to London, says, brother, the attack's at noon. OK, I think I'm getting some intelligence here. Then he hangs up and picks up the phone and makes a phone call to New York. I do not think you want us to hang up on the call. Right? That's actually the intelligence. So what we have is a process that when information to, from, or about an American it shows up in legitimate intelligence collection, we are required to suppress the American identity. Okay? That bad guy A talked to bad guy B and talked about a named U.S. person or talked about a named U.S. company, right? And so you don't mention the American identity. It's called minimization, it kind of fits. Unless, of course, the U.S. identity is the intelligence. Terrorist A talks to Terrorist B about a named U.S. company. If it's Delta Airlines, you kind of want to put that in the report. Okay? So you've got this. But, a, but that's a judgment call. You know? What I said in the afternoon of 9-11 is we're, we're moving the bar on the judgment call as to when you put the U.S. identity in in all communications to or from Afghanistan because we had just been attacked by an army, by an opposing armed enemy force headquartered in Afghanistan. So I called George Tenet, actually called the intel committees, set up, hey, I'm changing the ground rules here a little bit. George goes, tells, goes to tell the president. And uh, actually, the way George tells the story is, hey, Mike Hayden's doing, actually what George began the conversation with was, Mike Hayden's going to jail, Mr. President. <laughs> Okay. And the vice president, as he would say, don't worry, we'll bail him out. Okay? <laughs> and George tells the president what I, what I did. And the president says, good. Can he do anything more? So George goes back to Langley. He calls me up at Fort Meade. And George says, Mike told the president. The vice president said this. The president wants to know if you can do anything more. And I said, George, there is nothing more I can do within my current authorities. And there's a little pause. And George then says, that is not the question I asked you. Is there anything more you could do? Implying if you were authorized. So we went, we huddled up at Fort Meade and decided on two or three things that we felt would close the seam that was made very visible on 9-11. You know, we Americans, in, in securing our safety and our liberty, for about two centuries did it by saying, OK, all the foreign stuff gets over there. All the domestic stuff goes over here. All the intel guys, you work over here. All the law enforcement guys, you work over here. And 9-11 drove right through that seam. And so now the question became, how can you, as a foreign intelligence agency, best detect the one kind of communication you really ought to be on, terrorist communications, one end of which was in the United States? And Mr. Ambassador, the best thing we could come up with to fill that gap and make the lightest touch on American privacy was, in essence, the metadata program. And, and frankly, we didn't collect this, by the way. OK, the phone companies have it. I mean, we didn't put any alligator clips on the wires to collect the, mo the metadata. The phone companies have it because they want to bill you. All right? So, so we, just, we just asked, and the phone companies agreed to send us what essentially was billing data. So that if we captured a phone in Yemen, a phone from a bad guy, a phone we had never seen before, we could go to that ocean. It was an ocean, all right? And don't trivialize it. This is trillions of phone records. We could go to that ocean of records and simply say, hey, we got this number in Yemen. Any of you guys ever talk to him? And if a, if a number uh, in the Bronx said, yeah, yeah, well, yeah we did it, um, we said, that, who, who do you talk to? And at that point, Mr. Ambassador, I am now done explaining what NSA was allowed to do. That was the limit of the metadata program. 
After we'd established those connections, we then had to hand it over to the FBI. Um, that's a very brief, very rapid, really executive summary, summary uh, of what we did. But we felt it, it was the best thing we could do to close an identified and known weakness with the minimal impact on American privacy. So then there's this young guy who decides to download most of these records onto some system and fly off to Hong Kong and Moscow and releases it. Yeah. Uh, our friend Edward Snowden. What's the impact of Snowden yeah. on the ability to continue the, the essential yeah. intelligence function as you have described it? So I have strong views. If you, if you read the book, you'll see the strong views. But even somebody in my background knows this is a complicated issue. Yep. All right? Um, so the first Snowden stories out the door were on the program I just described for you. I was, I was sitting in a hotel out in La Jolla, and I got, a, I got an email from a reporter friend of mine who had forwarded to me a London Guardian story on, on the metadata, and, and it was, the, the, the title of the email was, what is this? Right. I did not respond to the email, <laughs> okay? Uh, but I read the story and go, oh man, how'd that get out there? Because it, it, it is a direct lineal descendant. Now, by, by the way, I mean, President Obama authorized it too. Oh, one more thing. Congress passed statutes to support it. Oh, the two intelligence committees were all in favor of it. Oh, and the FISA court over, was doing oversight. All right, so we had this bloodline to take us to 2011, and Snowden pushed that out the door. Uh, clearly the most controversial program he put out because you all didn't know, and being Americans, you're a little nervous about the, about the federal government having all your phone bills. And, and that's probably a foul on us, and I'll, I'll come back to that, all right? The other 99% of what Mr. Snowden put out, pushed out the door was how your security services collect foreign intelligence on legitimate foreign intelligence targets. Okay. What, is, what is the Fourth Amendment quotient to a story that tells the world that the National Security Agency was intercepting the emails of the Syrian Armed Forces? Okay. What American privacy angle was present in making known that NSA and GCHQ intercepted the satellite phone of Dmitry Medvedev during a G20 summit in the United Kingdom? Rick Leggett's the current deputy at NSA. Rick, uh, I knew Rick and, and helped mentor, an obviously very bright guy. Rick is on record, and this is very new, in the last 72, 96 hours, Rick is on record as saying publicly that we have identified close to 1,000 instances in which intelligence targets of the United States have changed communication practices based upon what they learned in the Snowden revelations. Now, Mr. Ambassador, I get it. He accelerated, and this is me coming full circle, a necessary national debate. I think he distorted it, but he no, no doubt accelerated it. And now, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. We in the intelligence community should have recognized how sensitive this was. And rather than sticking with the old formula, the president okayed it, the intelligence committees know about it, the court oversees it. What happened when it became public, a lot of Americans, and, you know, and, and far beyond the number who just were in tinfoil on their heads, I mean, a lot of Americans said that the president knew, the oversight committees knew, the courts knew, but that no longer in their mind constituted consent of the governed. A lot of Americans, serious thinking Americans said, that's consent of the governors. It's not consent of the governed. You may have told them, but you didn't tell me. Now, I don't think we can tell 320 million people how it is we collect, conduct espionage, but in this particular case, we probably should have shown more ankle earlier in order to, I, I don't mean to immunize you against the shock, all right? But, but when it came out cold turkey like that, say what? They've got all my phone bills at Fort Meade? That, that actually is a, a pretty stunning uh, revelation. So one reaction to that is Tim Cook deciding to create an <laughs> Apple iPhone that encrypts itself and doesn't allow uh, anybody to get in. There's no more backdoor. 
uh, you've gone on record to say that when this particular case between Tim Cook and Apple on the one hand and the FBI on the other hand, you think that's a good idea. I do. So and explain, explain, <laughs> explain why. yourself. Um, yeah, and, and there's a, there is an apparent inconsistency there. That's why the ambassador asked the question. Uh, but I don't think there is. All right. So you know the Apple issue, right? You, you, you've got, they've got to suppress their own operating system. Otherwise, FBI can't even take a run at breaking the encryption. By the way, the encryption is probably pretty easy to break with a brute force attack. But the phone is wired that after the 10th attempt to break the encryption, the, the data self-destructs. So you've got to suppress that aspect of the operating system, which is part of the overall protection of the data. You can argue this on, on constitutional grounds, and Apple is, mm -hmm. all right? First Amendment, freedom of speech, Fourth Amendment, privacy, 14th, uh, 13th Amendment, involuntary servitude, all right? Apple is arguing the government doesn't have the right to do that. I don't know. I'm not a constitutional scholar. I don't argue that. Other people argue that this is that old security privacy thing, and we, we need to balance security and privacy. Yeah, probably true, big deal. I'm not arguing that. I am looking at this through the lens of security just the way I looked at it, the Stellar Wind program, the metadata program, through the lens of security. And my position, and here's where the consistency comes in, within the limits of law, policy, and the Constitution, I actually thought the best response for American security was the metadata program. Within the limits of the law, policy, and constitution, I think the best response for American security is unbreakable end-to-end -end encryption without any front doors, back doors, or windows. I'm answering the question on security grounds. Jim Clapper is the DNI. The last three years, it's going on now, the worldwide threat briefings, it, it covers, gets covered in the press a little bit. It's kind of boring, but, but he goes in there and kind of lays out you know, what, what I'm wringing my hands about. Number one for the last three years was cyber and cyber insecurity. So now you've got really good encryption, a really good operating system that our government wants to actually make less capable. All right, and by the way, the government will argue, well, it's only less capable in a one-off case, but most technologists say once you've done it, you've done it. Okay. So they want to go ahead and degrade what most technologists believe is the right approach to making this more secure in order to solve other really legitimate security problems in the criminal lane and in the terrorist lane. That's the warp and woof of the book. It's never black and white. It's always trade-offs. It's always balancing risk. And in this case, I act, given, given the cyber danger, I actually think the best security answer is to protect the end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. By the way, the other option is to use a court or legislation to block technological progress. I don't think that's a winning hand. No, I think that's, uh, that, that's right. But there is a judgment, I think, in, in, in that argument that you're making, which is, a, which is an important argument, that if you now balance the slash terrorism security yep. threat versus the cyber threat, right. that latter one is, is larger. Is, is, let's, is larger. So, so, yeah. so let's talk about that. We, I don't think we've paid enough attention to uh, the reported fact, let me underscore that, uh, that we have just seen, not in this country, but in Ukraine, yeah first cyber attack on civilian infrastructure when someone, some country, shut down <clears throat> part of the electrical system of Ukraine. That's a big deal. Yeah. How big a deal? And where do you see this going? So, and, and there's a whole, by the way, I, I finished, I, I thought I finished this book. I got the manuscript kind of in a mature phase. And I said, I don't even have a chapter in, in here on cyber. So I went back and wrote a chapter on cyber, I think it's, it's chapter eight, in which I try to pull out all these, all these issues. Uh, we now have weapons comprised of ones and zeros that are capable of creating physical destruction. All right? And that, that's a big deal. Now you mentioned the Ukrainian power grid, and I, I, won't, and I am not going into this in detail, 
that somebody used a cyber weapon to destroy 1,000 centrifuges in Iran, okay. which I view as an unalloyed good, by the way. All right. But let me describe that Stuxnet attack in a slightly different way. Someone, almost certainly a nation state, because it's too hard to do from the basement, someone, almost certainly a nation state, just used a weapon comprised of ones and zeros during a time of peace to destroy what another nation could only describe as critical infrastructure. Holy smoke. That's a big deal. And now, fast forward to the question you asked right, right before Christmas. Our government now believes that people in Russia, I think it's criminal gangs operating on behalf of the Russian Federation, all right? People in Russia conducted a cyber attack against the electrical grid in the western Ukraine and turned out the lights for about a quarter million people. All right? that, that, that's what, in, in my profession, we call the demonstration attack. You know, it's not catastrophic, it's, you see what I mean? Right? And so that is a reality uh, that is out there. Now, you want me, want me to scale the danger? Mm -hmm. um, if the Chinese are turning out the lights east of the Mississippi, that is not the first thing on the president's agenda the next morning. If the Chinese are conducting such a catastrophic attack, if a near peer is conducting such a catastrophic attack, it is a subset of something that's really bad. So although that's really bad, I don't think that's very likely. I have now kind of focused myself on the cyber danger from the renegade, isolated, sanctioned, nothing to lose, ah, oh, what the hell, let's roll the dice, nation state, which is kind of a permanent definition of North Korea. It could be a definition of Iran in some unusual circumstances. I can, in my darker moments, I can even think of it being a description of a Russia under great stress because of the low price of oil, because of West, Western sanctions, and you got Vladimir Vladimirovich there with high torque between his autocrats and his kleptocrats. And he's somehow got to poke back to demonstrate this isn't cost free, big guy. Right? And so, so I'm not quite worried about the catastrophic, we're all going down, we're all going dark, but I am worried about this kind of this mid band attack that, that, that the renegade state might be willing to conduct against us kind of like a Sony North America Plus, okay? You would be familiar with what happened with Sony North America, which was a very destructive attack, and we know the North Koreans did. That, that's kind of where I am right now with, with the danger. Let me ask you one question, more question, uh, a different subject before we go and open oh, with drones. Uh, you wrote about uh, drones in the New York <coughs> Times. It was part of the, from the book, and, and, and a very powerful defense uh, of, of targeted killing. Uh, you've said that this is the most accurate instrument of warfare we have seen, and, and there's no doubt that when it gets the right target, uh, it does it in an effective way. The issue, of course, is how do we make sure that the target that we want to kill is killed and nothing else is. And what I want to ask <coughs> you about in particular is when we move from a clear identification of a target to so-called signature strikes. Yes. If one, could you explain the difference between the two? And second, explain how signature strikes, how you can, can minimize to the degree we all want to, uh, the possibility of collateral yeah. damage. So, so, so the New York Times ran an excerpt from the book. Uh, the book chapter is more nuanced and frankly more balanced than the excerpt, so I recommend you, you look at the book chapter. But the New York Times had a wonderful headline for the excerpt, which I didn't write, they wrote. And the headline was drone strikes, necessary, precise, and imperfect, which I think is the message I was trying to communicate. They just did it better in four or five, in, in four or five words. And I did say, these are the most precise weapons in the history of armed conflict. Now that's a relative judgment, all right? It doesn't mean they're perfect, it means they're just better than everything else. You know, compare it to a B-2, a B-52, compare it to a fast mover, F-15, F-16, compare it to artillery fire, indirect fire weapons, 122, 130 millimeter. You're staring at this thing for hours, if not days. 
You, you, you know the, the entire patterns of behavior from, from a UAV. You've got signals intelligence checking in as to who they are. You've got human sources on the ground that put you on the compound in the first place. And you've got a weapon whose margin of missed distance is measured in inches. Okay? And that said, you do the best you can, but it is warfare. And, and sometimes I, th there's an explicit example in the book where the United States killed Abu Khabab al-Masri, who was a WMD chief, chief for al-Qaeda. And, and the United States moved to heaven and earth not to kill his grandson, who was sleeping about 15 feet away from him. The United States weaponeered that thing in every which way. But we failed. And his grandson died. Right? So it's, those things happen. Signature strikes and targeted strikes. Um, sometimes you know exactly who's in that SUV. Sometimes you know where that SUV spends all of its time and the kinds of people that an SUV carries, but you don't know exactly who's in the SUV. And I, and I make the point that in signature strikes, this isn't hit and miss. In fact, in signature strikes, you often have more intelligence than you do when you actually know the person because you have to build up almost encyclopedic knowledge of the compound, the activity, the people in order to make a decision that you actually have a, a legal and ethical right do, uh, to, to go ahead and, and, and pull the trigger. Uh, this is very controversial. I was blessed in the book. It, it, it is barely in the Times article, but in the book, our government released about a dozen letters to and from Osama bin Laden, uh, incident to a court case in Manhattan about two years ago. If you don't believe me about the effectiveness of drone strikes, believe Al-Qaeda, read the excerpts in the book from the letters. And this is an enemy under tremendous stress. And they actually wail over the precision of, of the strikes. Again, necessary, precise, imperfect. I end the chapter, I end the chapter by pointing out that, hey, look, I get it. Even if I harvest the immediate effect, remember OSS, okay, the focus on the here and now? Even if I harvest the immediate effect, this guy is no longer going to come over the perimeter wire and kill us. I know there are second and third and fourth order effects to these strikes. Mm -hmm. Even when they're done very well, I know there is occasional collateral damage. I know we become part of their recruitment videos. I know we alienate our allies in Western Europe who do not agree, none of them agree with our legal theory under which we have done this under two presidents, not just one. So we always knew there were downsides even when we decided we had to go do it. And so I borrow a phrase from Richard Haas, whom we talked about earlier, who uh, does what the ambassador does here in somewhat in New York for the council. And Richard and I were on Fareed Zakari about two years ago having the same conversation. And Richard's line, I shamelessly use in the book. What we want here with regard to drone strikes is not a switch, but a dial. That you don't, you're not tempted to overuse it. That you understand you're gonna to have to live with the long-term effects. But you don't wanna give this up because sometimes you just gotta go do what you gotta do. I think this uh, <clears throat> it's a wonderful way to start the question and answer, the answers we've gotten, the questions, <laughs> the question period. Uh, we have microphones throughout the room. Uh, please raise your arm and uh, I will recognize you. And then the only thing you need to do is to make sure that your question is indeed a question. So this, let me open up the floor. I can't, no, right here on the, on the, on the third, uh, the second level. You may want to come around, it may be easier. There you go. Oh, there we go. Hi, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. And answering our questions, um, providing new ones. How close are any other countries to developing the kind of drones that we have and the uh, ability to pinpoint? And yeah. how much of a danger is that going to be in our future? Yeah, I, um, we're, we're probably two, two or three sine waves ahead of everyone else. But we always knew we were breaking trail and other people were going to be skiing in our tracks. And the fact that we were doing it was going to make it easier for them to ski. And so part of the moral dimension of this was to actually do this in a way that didn't legitimate other states 
using these with, with less precision, less conscience, uh, less paying attention to the laws of armed conflict. Um, I read a, a, and again, this is my reading publicly available sources, that we're probably up to about a half a dozen countries who have actually used a drone in anger now. Okay? None, none on the scale we, we have, are, and will. But there, but there are others coming, and I, I, I take your point. But again, I mean, the, the, the fabric of the book is none of this is easy. And we're, 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 we're living in an absolute terrain of gray in which you've got to make some hard choices. And I've already complained that sometimes the urgency of the moment drives out the importance of the distance, right? And you could make the argument that some of the things we did may, may have fit that model but we had to make the best decisions we could make in the circumstances we find ourselves. But, but you're right. This is going to become a global issue as other nations. This is not that hard to do, all right? I mean, I, help, my, my wife's up here. We, we bought one of our grandchildren a drone for her 16th birthday, all right? A, Unarmed. A, 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 um, <laughs> A, a, a gift went unwrapped that did comment, <laughs> that did draw a comment from one of the people at the party was, this is so ironic on so many levels. <laughs> <laughs> so, and by the way, and the imagery that, that you get from that $300 product is HD. Uh, here, the third, uh, fourth row from the front. Other side, yeah, thank you. So do you consider Edward Snowden a traitor? And do you think he would get a fair civilian trial in the US? I, I don't use the word traitor because treason is kind of a narrowly defined concept in the, in the Constitution. Um, I use the word defector. And I, and I allow myself to say he betrayed the folks with whom he worked, all right? Who actually are actually very dedicated to doing what they do and keeping the secrets, all right? Um, he wants to come back to the states under the conditions he defines as a fair trial, which he defines as a public interest defense. Yeah, I know I stole the documents. Yeah, I know they're all marked top secret. Yeah, I know I made them all public. But you know, I actually think it was a good thing. And so I want to, I want to base my defense on public interest. I'll just, I'll just retreat back to my own Catholic liberal arts education and Henry David Thoreau on civil disobedience. Civil disobedience, even when it is elegant and justified, gets its moral legitimacy by the willingness to accept the consequences for breaking the law as it existed at that time. And so if he were to come back, I think he gets a jury of his peers. I don't think he's coming back. All the way in the back there, right on the, on the uh, corner, right. Good evening, uh, General Hayden. Uh, Major Roman Ortega, my question is, in an era of increased inflammatory political rhetoric, how does the dynamic aid or hinder American intelligence? I'm not sure of the background of your question. Could you be a little more? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I try to say in the book is that these are always hard. I mean, I, I'll, I'll repeat, it's all gray, all right? And, and, and these are very, very difficult decisions. And our presidential campaign this season, kind of they always do that, but this season they've especially done it, have taken these complicated issues and pushed them down actually below the level of sophistication of bumper stickers. <laughs> and and, and that, that is tremendously harmful to, 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 to us as a nation, but, but to this as an enterprise. All right, I was on Bill Maher Friday night and he asked me about uh, Mr. Trump's uh, commitment that we will hold terrorist families at risk. All right, I mean, that is, I mean, look, I, I did edgy things. It's the title of the book, all right? I get it. And, and some people can say that was, those were bad things. I get that, all right? But I said, play to the edge. There were edges, there were lines, all right? To put terrorist families at risk, I, I said to Maher, and he kind of double clutched on me that uh, I said, the armed forces of the United States will not do that. 
right? It violates their professional ethic. It violates the laws of armed conflict. These are honorable men and women. They will not perform that task. And, 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 and to actually have that as part of our public discourse, is, I mean, it, it's kind of mind-numbing. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm on a roll now. Here I go. Um, <laughs> and, and, then, and, and then to play into the jihadi narrative that there is undying enmity between Islam and Christendom by going out and saying, and we're not going to let any of those guys in our country, actually doesn't just cheapen the debate. It has actually already made you less safe. OK, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to do that. Uh, right here on, on the edge, yes. Gentleman. <clears throat> So can we talk about the title for the book, Playing to the Edge? So I understand the intelligence agency needs to push the edge. But in, in an environment where the risk is always changing, that edge is always changing. So how in a democracy do you set where the edge is, given its constant change and the need for secrecy? Boy, thank you. Great All right. Question. So we thought we had a deal. All right. It came out of the Church Pike investigations of the mid-1970s in, in, which, in which we Americans took something that had actually been exclusively the province of the executive, this stuff. I mean, espionage and covert action was, was always the province of, of the president. And after the Church Pike and the, the real and imagined abuses of the 1970s, we, we, we actually started a, a grand uh, political experiment we actually moved a significant portion of oversight of espionage into our parliament, into, into, in, into our Congress, in terms of the two oversight committees, who, by law, have to be fully and currently informed of all significant intelligence. And for some things that touch upon your privacy, right, we put some espionage functions under the supervision of a court. All right? By the way, we are still alone in that. The other Western democracies do not have nearly the invasive parliamentary oversight of their espionage that we do in the United States. European parliamentarians know more about American espionage and do their moral clucking about it because they don't know anything about their own. It remains in the province of the executive. So, so. Um, NSA is chugging along with the 215 program, authorized by the president, legislated by Congress, overseen by the committees, and checking in with the FISA court as required by law. NSA is thinking they got the Madisonian trifecta going for them. Okay, they got all three branches of government. We are good to go. And that's why when this came out, NSA was so backfooted on this. They, they, really, they really lost weeks trying to explain themselves to the, to the broader population. What has happened in this, I'm sorry, that's all the wind up. Here's the pitch in answering your question. What has happened is the political culture under that social contract I just described for you, which by the way is even unusual and it's actually forward leaning in terms of transparency, the political culture shifted underneath it. The political culture is no longer underneath it to give it sustenance. There's no fundament, right? You all have changed. It's back to, you may have told them, you didn't tell me, it's consent of the governors, not consent of the governed. And so now, and this is the last 20% of the book, it's so, what are we gonna do? Carly Fiorina was the head of my civilian advisory board at CIA. And, and I can't remember specifically, it was either late 07 or early 08. So this is way pre-Snowden, all right? I turned to Carly and said, Carly, I'm getting worried. Here's the question. You get some smart people on the board, you go, you go think about it, talk to whoever you want to think about it, and answer me this. Will America be able to conduct espionage in the future, as you correctly identify, an enterprise that requires secrecy for success? Will America be able to conduct espionage in the future inside a broader political culture that every day demands more transparency and more public accountability from every aspect of national life? And they went, went, went away to the mountaintop, they studied it, Four months later, they come back. I walk across the eighth floor deck at Langley. I, seventh floor deck at Langley. I sit in my conference room. Carly, will America be able to conduct espionage inside a broader political culture, more transparency, more accountability? And she looks me squarely in the eye and says, ah, hard, hard to say. <laughs> Which was a fair and accurate answer. And, and, and so what I'm suggesting to you is that we've got some adult conversing to do as to how this enterprise gets legitimized 
by your approval without making this enterprise, enterprise not worth doing in the first place. And I, I don't have really good answers for that. I, I use the word not transparency in the book, I use translucence. And if you, if you picture the, the di difference between the two words, something that's translucent, I get to see the broad movements, the shapes, the, the motions, but I don't see the fine print. But that is the core question that I leave unanswered at, at the end of the book. How are we going to go do this going forward? I know we have a lot of students in. Uh, and can we get a student way in the back on the right-hand side? I think we have two students, actually, so we may get another one. Um, so my question has to do with this concept of being translucent that you're just talking about. So I think an excellent example of this would be the FISA court, right? But I, as a citizen, can't really have any trust in it when I have no idea how it operates and I hear that over 99% of the cases that are brought to the FISA court, they approve for further research in terms of people and what they're doing. So my question is, how can we really ever have a translucent, as you phrase it, government agency that people can establish trust with? Yeah, no, you, you, you've kind of encapsulated the dilemma. But, but remember how I, I try to set this up. I get it, the FISA court is secret. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Munich for the Munich Security Conference. It was right after one of the stories about who may or may not have been listening to Angela Merkel's phone calls, all right? And I'm in Munich. And I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm, on, the, um, I'm on the Munich Security Conference official, uh, official agenda, except I'm scheduled for 10.30 at night in the bar, okay? It's a true story. Okay, we're on the stage in the bar. It's 10.30 at night. All right, I'm there with August Honing, who used to be my counterpart in Germany. Uh, Jane, Jane Harmon, former member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, a German businessman, and the moderator was from Der Spiegel. All right? And I got 200 Germans eating palm fritz and swollen pills, all right? and I'm going to talk about American intelligence. And so I, I blurted out, and like I did here, and it's under the FISA court, all right? And I, there was a voice from the back of the room, accented English, saying, a very unusual court. It's secret. And I go, well, I agree with half of what you said. It's a very unusual court. It's unusual because it exists. I repeat, no other Western democracy puts questions of espionage in front of its judicial branch. Okay? And it does so in secrecy because that was part of the deal. I mean, how do we get more oversight without making this public? We bring in another branch of government. Now, I've heard the number about, about the FISA court and the rubber stamp thing, and, and the numbers do tempt you to that conclusion. Anyone who jumps to that conclusion has never brought a warrant to the FISA court. Okay? At the end of the day, most get approved. But there is an awful lot of self-filtering at the beginning, and there's an awful lot of changing the warrant based upon initial objections from, from the judge. Uh, we could probably stand with more transparency there, but think of the dilemma. Think of the dilemma we create. By the way, this is the same court that gives law enforcement warrants, all right? Think of the dilemma we create if we have to make public that we're up on Tony Soprano's phone, okay? There's a reason that's done in secrecy. And, and so we have, this, we have this dilemma. There was another student right there. Yeah, uh, exactly. <clears throat> Hi. Um, so you talked a lot about how terrorism was one of the most immediate threats to our country right now. And I was wondering how much of a real threat you think Syrian refugees pose in that regard. Yeah, here, here's how I answer the question, all right? And, and it, it's going to sound a little cartoonish, but it's actually from the heart. Here's what, I would advise, here's what I would advise any president, any governor, or any mayor, okay? To bring whoever it is they think is responsible for providing them security. So for the president, it's, it's the DNI and the CIA guy and the FBI guy, and, and make the following speech. We got a lot of people who need our help. I am gonna go out there and sound like St. Francis of Assisi. People are gonna confuse me with Mother Teresa. I am going to be so generous to these people who need our help. And now you, you make sure nothing bad happens. Get it? And that to me is the answer that we should 
we should embrace. We are a welcoming people. We should welcome people in need, and we should then turn to our security services, and you guys do what you got to do to make sure nothing bad happens. Gentlemen, over the far left, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to go back to your morality curve. Donald Trump and what he wants to do to the families is beyond the pale. But then we go back, torture is okay, and I want to see how far it goes. So with the phones, let's say one of the San Bernardino shooters was alive. Can you torture them to get their phone open? Can you torture if they're U.S. or non-U.S.? If the security that was on the phone wasn't Apple, but it was some foreign national, someone from Al-Qaeda had their own uh, security, can you torture them to open up the phone? I, I think that when you go to Donald Trump, it's just a natural expansion of, once you've said torture is okay, then people keep moving forward and forward. But where is the line? Yeah, well, first of all, to correct the record, if I've left any mis mis misimpression here, I've never said torture is okay. All right? We use enhanced interrogation techniques that the Department of Justice said were not torture. The harshest technique we use was waterboarding. My deputy was waterboarded at CIA. Right? Tens of thousands of American airmen were waterboarded. But I go back to the earlier story. I get it if you say, I don't want you doing that. Right? But we were faced with very tough choices. We were faced with a, a time of what we believed, and frankly, there was a consensus that I think was correct, was of great danger. And we used extraordinary measures. But as, but as we came out of that period of great danger, that's part of my narrative in 2006, the number of extraordinary measures that were still legitimate were, were, were very dramatically reduced. The European concept is proportionality, all right? We don't use that here. In, in American law, we use the concept of what shocks the conscience. And frankly, what shocks the conscience depends upon the totality of circumstances in which you find yourself. A particular act in these circumstances may always shock the conscience. In other circumstances, they, they, they may not. So I get it that we argue where the edge is. There are some things that are clearly beyond the edge. There are some things that are clearly nowhere near the edge. And then people who have to make real decisions in the real world live in that gray space. And they make the best call they, they can make. Again. This is not a defense of torture, certainly. It's not even a defense of enhanced interrogation techniques. It's simply a defense of history. Let me tell you what happened. And then, you know, adult Americans will make it. By the way, after the Sissy report came out, and this was a very harsh report that I, that I actually attacked pretty, pretty strongly in the book. It was, it was relentlessly prosecutorial against the agency for the detentions and interrogation program. Brookings which is not your chewing the carpet right wing think tank in DC. I mean, they, they, are, they are center line. Brookings conducted multiple surveys of the American people. And by a ratio of two to one, even after this report, it was, yeah, I wish we didn't have to do that, but I understand why. And when they, when they normalized the answers for people who were following this issue more rather than less, the number of people who said they were OK with it was actually higher. I bring that up only to suggest to you that the people who did this aren't aliens. They share your values. And in fact, in retrospect, the American people seems to have validated what it was they did. Now again, you know, I get it. This is really controversial. I just want you to understand that these people were doing their best to do the right thing by you. They were, yeah, here's the way I want to put it. They were trying to apply your values in circumstances you never had to face. Gentlemen over there on the uh, far end. I, I would just like to say, thank God for people like you who protect all the people in this room and all of our families. Thank you for your service. I was wondering if you could quantify the severity and the frequency of cyber attacks on the U.S. intelligence network. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've had successful attacks against classified networks. 
Uh, Bill Lynn, former Deputy Secretary of Defense, in a famous article in Foreign Affairs about four or five years ago, lays out uh, an attack against us. By and large, and let me, let me kind of do this from the outside in. Or no, let me do it from the inside out. By and large, American classified networks are pretty safe. All right? Dot gov, not nearly as much. Dot com, oh my God. Okay? And the problem is, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's really important to American well-being that's out there in dot com. And so what we have, and what this, this is what the point I'm trying to drive, is what we have are nation states, okay, nation states going after you. They're going after your stuff, your IP, your intellectual property, your negotiating positions, your personal stuff. All right? Now look, I, I actually make this very plain in the book. We steal stuff too. And we are really good at stealing stuff. Okay? And I'm talking here about cyber. All right? We're the best in the world. There's no question about it. All right? But we only steal stuff to keep you free and keep you safe. We do not steal stuff to make you rich. And I, I know of four other countries who can say that last sentence and have it be true. They're the usual suspects. They all speak English. All right? Okay? It's a total of five. Every, every other country feels as if it is legitimate state espionage to steal for commercial advantage. And so what you have now, you have American industry being attacked by a nation state, a big nation state, like the People's Republic of China. That's what that playing field looks like. And, and so I'm not as much concerned about China coming after me and my old job. You know, we're all big boys. Um, so China went after OPM, right? Stole 24.5 million records, including mine. Okay. They, they have the detailed life history of everybody in the United States with a security clearance. That kind of angers me. But I have said publicly, if I could have done that against the Chinese while I was director of NSA, I would have done it in a heartbeat. And here's the punchline. I didn't have to go downtown and ask anybody's permission. That's what governments do to one another. It's an R-rated movie. Okay. What I am offended by is someone using the power of a state not to go after state secrets, but to go after non-defense related information in order to empower their own state-owned enterprises. And, and so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be rambling, but your, your thing was, how safe are we up here for the classified? Yeah, I, I'm not wringing my hands about that. I am wringing my hands about foreign governments using the power of the state to steal American commercial property. General, thank you so much for uh, spending this evening with us. Uh, it's been enlightening. Uh, copies of your book are available for purchase, and you will be signing them. And please, all of you, uh, join me in thanking General Hayden for the amazing discussion. Thank you. Thank you. That was terrific.